I'm Bob Brocker. I'm the president of the Colorado Senior Lobby. So uh, welcome to the uh, our first annual Col Older Coloradans Week. So what is this all about anyway? Well, one third of Colorado's population is now over the age of 50. And so we, and I'll, I'll mention who the we is in a, in a moment here, are exploring the areas uh, that those two million people have in common to create a larger voice in the creation of public policy. So this week begins a new chapter in finding and developing that voice. And so the we that I just mentioned are representatives of uh, these groups. Uh, you, the, the slide was up earlier, but I'll, I'll mention each. You know, Senior Lobby, obviously, uh, Aging 2.0, Colorado Chapter, Changing the Narrative, the Bell Policy Center, uh, Carbondale Age Friendly Community Initiative, the CU Anschutz Multidisciplinary Center on Aging, Time Bank of the Rockies, and the Center for African American Health. So uh, we thank all these all these folks for getting involved, and um, many of you have been volunteers in helping put this together. And we deeply appreciate all of our volunteers. So. Um, a quick overview of what we're going to be doing today and, the, and, and Tuesday and Wednesday. So today is, is what we, about what, more about what we do with that larger voice that I mentioned earlier. Tomorrow we hear from people from all over the state and have some discussion about some of their concerns. And then Wednesday morning is about those 2 million people that are over the age of 50 in relation to working. And then we conclude in the afternoon, we hear uh, from House Speaker Garnett and have some discussion about what we've learned the previous few days. So I'd like to remind everyone, if you have questions along the way, put those in the chat box, please, uh, and keep yourselves on mute. Um, and um, let's see, what else do we need to say? And I guess that's about it. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Jeanette Hensley, uh, who's in Hawaii, uh, sort of, um, and uh, Jeanette is the uh, co-chair of our Senior Lobby Legislative uh, Committee, and uh, she will introduce our Lieutenant Governor. So go ahead, Jeanette. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's um, nice to be here on a nice Monday morning, and no, I'm not really in Hawaii, but my daughter is, so I'm babysitting um, her two girls, or my two grandbabies, so I thought I would be there by um, extension because this is the view they get to see. Uh, so, and I thought we all could use a nice view of some warm weather <laughs> and the moving palm trees. So anyway, it's uh, my pleasure to be able to introduce the uh, Lieutenant Governor who is one of the hardest working public servants that I've ever known. Um, her and I actually go back way, go way back because we worked together at um, healthcare policy and financing many years ago. Um, and we have uh, developed a very good friendship, but she is very much of an advocate for healthcare for everyone, all ages, and especially for seniors. And she is just um, tirelessly working to be able to make sure that Colorado is a better place for us to live and to making sure that healthcare is better and also um, more affordable for all of us here in Colorado. So with that, I'd like to introduce our Lieutenant Governor, Diane Primavera. Well, thank you, Jeanette. And I was gonna say, if you're in Hawaii and you haven't uh, invited me, then I was really gonna be upset because we, we're, we're BFFs and we go way back. So <laughs> anyway, thanks for the great introduction and good morning everyone else. And uh, thank you to the Colorado Senior Lobby uh, for bringing us all together for the first ever Older Coloradoans Week. So next year, I'm optimistic that we'll be kicking off Older Coloradoans Week at the state capitol and not on our computers or in Arizona or Hawaii with Jeanette and Kelly. Uh, yet here we are still in this remote world, so we must make the most of it. And I'm pleased with the creativity and adaptability of Colorado Senior Lobby uh, with this week of events, particularly the focus on reimagining advocacy in the virtual world. But while I'm pleased with this creativity and adaptability, I'm not surprised because after all, us older adults are resourceful and resilient and we've shown that, shown that over and over again uh, throughout this pandemic and before. 
For years, the Colorado Senior Lobby has been a presence at our state capitol, advocating and fighting for the rights and recognition of older Coloradoans and making it clear that this is that as we age, our voices don't fade away. And it's important that this ability to engage with lawmakers is not lost in our new normal of Zoom and Google Hangout meetings. So I commend Colorado Senior Lobby for taking the steps to ensure that our older Coloradoans have the opportunity to continue their active engagement in our legislative process during these times. Your voice is so important and it should be heard. And I know that part of Older Coloradoans Week involves hearing from folks representing rural communities and from diverse backgrounds. And we know that older Coloradoans don't just live along the front range, they live in cities and towns, unincorporated communities and on tribal lands. And at the end of the day, one of the most beautiful parts about our state is the uniqueness of our community and the incredible diversity that we see from corner to corner. I commend these steps towards inclusivity and representation from around Colorado. Now, I would be remiss to not mention our vaccine distribution efforts this morning, as I'm sure many of you have either already received your vaccine, as I heard, and I have too, or some are waiting to schedule your appointment. For those of you still trying to get your vaccine, please be patient. I know how frustrating and confusing this can be. I hear from people every day, but I can assure you that you will have the opportunity to be vaccinated whether it's next week or a few weeks from now. We're confident that we can reach our goal of vaccinating 70% of Coloradoans aged 70 plus by the end of February. And we open vaccines up to Coloradoans aged 65 to 69 today. So if you're looking to sign up and make an appointment to receive your vaccine, you can find the latest contact information for providers at, and I'll give you this address and you might wanna get a pencil, www.cocovidvaccine.org. That's www.cocovidvaccine.org. Or you can call 1 877 COVAXCO. That's V A X. Or that also is 1 877 268 2926. 1 877 268-2926 for more information and to get connected to resources available and that's in multiple languages. Again, for your friends and family that may not be online, the phone number you can share is 1-877-COVAXCO. Uh, we just recently ramped up our staff and we're open 24 seven so there shouldn't be a long wait time. So like so, like so many of you, I've mostly been in my home uh, as Jeanette will tell you uh, since last March, uh, but being a four-time uh, cancer survivor and at an age range that is considered high risk, I committed myself to doing everything I could to protect myself as well as those around me so that I can be here for my children and my beautiful grandchildren and so that I could continue serving this great state. So in addition to being pretty much quarantined, that included wearing my mask, social distancing, and limiting my social interactions, although I'd love to get together with Jeanette every day. So I know so many of you have done the same, but we need to keep it up. Even though vaccines are being administered across our state, we need to continue taking safety precautions to protect ourselves and others. But we're on a steady path towards recovery and rebuilding our communities. And as we look to build back, we want to continue building toward that vision of Colorado for all. And older Coloradoans have an important role to play in this process, process. So let me conclude by saying that we know that Colorado is one of the best states in the country for adults to engage in encore careers, volunteerism, and various forms of value-driven engagement as they age. This is good news because current and future generations of older Coloradoans will provide economic, social, and civic value to our communities for decades to come. It's important that our elected leaders are aware of the value we bring to our communities and our state. So again, I wanna thank the Colorado Senior Lobby for inviting me to kick off Older Coloradoans Week. And I wanna thank you all for your vigilance and advocacy on a wide range of aging issues. Thank you. Great, okay, thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. And now we'll be able to switch it over to Rich Morrow for a few more comments. Unmuting, thank you, 
Uh, Lieutenant Governor Prima Vera, it's nice to have you with us this morning. And so I'm going to do a brief little introduction for the rest of our time with me and Jeanette and Kelly Fritz of AARP Colorado to um, present on uh, what we call advocacy in a virtual world, uh, sort of an adaptation of presentations we've given before on uh, advocacy on state legislative issues. And uh, we'll have some comments about how that has changed um, over the last year because of the pandemic. Um, and I think at the same time, we'll, we'll be giving some uh, ideas uh, or some comments about uh, some legislation that we're looking forward to uh, when the legislature uh, at least intends to reconvene uh, on uh, next week on February 16th. Um, so first, um, I'll, I'll mention, I think it was mentioned, Jeanette is uh, uh, on the Colorado Senior Lobby Board and, and uh, co-chair of uh, the, our legislative committee. Uh, Kelly Fritz is, uh, is, I think it's, and Kelly, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Associate Director of AARP Colorado for Advocacy and um, longtime uh, worker there and a uh, great advocate for older adults. So we look forward to hearing from her. And then um, I, and uh, we're going to start with Jeanette, who will talk about um, how senior lobby um, works its legislative advocacy and some of the changes that um, they had to do this last last session and what they anticipate for the com coming session. I'll follow with some uh, overview of how the legislative process works and then we'll have Kelly talk about AARP's priorities and fill in any gaps I think that that we may have missed and um, then we'll see what kind of time we have uh, for questions, but we'll be uh, attempting to uh, answer questions in the chat uh, as we go forward, um, so that we can uh, deal with those uh, while we're while we're talking. So, if um, there is, if I haven't forgotten anything, I think I will go ahead and turn it over to Jeanette, and uh, you guys will give me a second. I'm supposed to share my screen, and so we can sort of follow, we'll follow through this PowerPoint. You're not married to it, but hopefully it'll just kind of give a basic um, outline of uh, where we're gonna be going with this. So everybody let me know if, um, if we're okay or if we're not okay on the screen. You're okay, Rich. We look good, okay, all right. So I'm gonna go down to the first slide and turn it over to Jeanette. Well, thank you very much, um, Rich. And if you want to go ahead and put it into the slideshow. Oh, yeah, um, I got it. I see. I knew I was going to forget something. There <laughs> we go. Okay. All right. That's good. So thank you, everyone, again, for joining. And for those that are still joining, it's very nice to be able to see that we have a large number of individuals that are um, excited and being able to um, learn and to hear a little bit more about what's going on for Advocate advocacy this year. Um, as Rich has said, I am the um, kind of the capital gang chair. So what we do is that we go down to, well, what we used to do is we would be down at the Capitol uh, several days a week and being able to testifying on bills or um, talking with different legislators, scheduling meetings to talk about some of the bills, um, some of the issues and concerns that we may have had with it. Um, so uh, th those are some of the things that, that we um, are trying, that we do. So we also, um, a lot of times would hang out in the basement cafeteria because that's usually where everybody would kind of go through. Uh, and so a lot of times you're able to stop a legislator or they would stop us and, st and ask us about their questions and concerns about some of the bills as well. So. But let me tell you, senior lobby, we are nonpartisan, we are all volunteers, and we are a nonprofit. And while we are doing that, 
um, we, what we really want to be able to do is to educate and inform um, all Coloradoans. So that means it's not just our legislators, but it's also our community leaders, um, elected officials, and some of the policymakers, which means as um, state agencies, uh, to be able to make sure that we improve the well-being for all Coloradans. So how do we do this? Well, we have um, different areas that people can help to volunteer with. So we do uh, research and on our website, you'll find some different uh, you know, uh, papers discussing some of the areas that are a concern to us. Uh, one in particular is um, how the value of, of older adults and what they get back. So, uh, but a lot of times if you have questions, you can go to our website and look up and see what it is we have. Uh, we, so we have fact sheets that we um, provide to the legislators. Um, we also advocate for changes that improve everybody's lives. Um, and we, when we mean that, we don't, we're not talking about just those in the front range. We definitely are focusing on some of the areas for our rural Coloradans. And we also form the coalitions and other uh, organizations such as AARP um, and uh, Seniors Answers and Services and a variety of different places, mm -hmm. uh, different um, organizations. So these are the areas where you can um, really become an advocate as well, because we really need people with all backgrounds. Um, there's no experience required. We will train you as to how you can um, learn to advocate uh, and you know, answer your questions. Uh, we're, we're there to you know, stand beside you and you know, whatever it is that we need to be able to do. So next slide. Okay. So again, we educate, inform and engage just so that we can make sure that everybody um, is better informed um, and when we get together on our Monday morning meetings, uh, we get together to discuss the issues and trainings. And it doesn't mean that everybody agrees to the same thing. So it's just something that um, we really learn and we educate each other. And we also have speakers come in that uh, a lot of times will educate us on what the different bills or issues are. So our website um, has a lot of this good information on there. We send out our newsletters, uh, which uh, we kind of do that um, anywhere between once a month or a couple, you know, every other month. Um, just really depends on what's happening in the policy areas and stuff. Uh, we provide advocacy training. Like I was saying, we will actually, when the session starts, if people are interested, we can provide a very detailed and specific thing on how do you advocate? How do you reach out to your legislator? Um, who is it that is your legislator? Do you know your uh, state senator? Do you know your state representatives? How to find out how to contact them um, and providing just a little tips and tricks on what it is that you need to be able to provide. So, and like I say, we provide our Monday morning meetings, which um, is held monthly during the week, I mean, during the session. And then in the summertime, it's pretty much every other week. And during the every other week ones in the summertime, people say, well, there's no session. So what are you guys doing? That's where we really focus on different materials to do the research um, and to start thinking about uh, what other bills or areas that, you know, maybe did not get passed in previous year that we want to bring back or something new that a, a member has brought up to us. So uh, Rich, we next slide. Okay. So um, again, we are at the Capitol a lot or we were. We would be um, walking the halls and uh, we would be standing outside the rooms and that was so, so beneficial because that is where we could do a quick hello to our, our um, bill sponsors or to go in and talk with them in their offices, or we were um, be able to just say, hey, we really liked what you said on this, but 
can you maybe add this next time when you're talking about that bill or here's a here's a response to that question that somebody asked you or that you asked another presenter so those are things that we really are able to help out a lot with and again we check you know we talk with other groups you know because it's really important that for older adults all of the different groups are you know focusing on the same thing we all come up with you know and we show a, a solid front of all of us you know moving forward um, in the same area we uh, we will also sometimes go in and provide a legislator will stop and ask us and say you know can you tell me how many you know blah blah blahs you know whatever and we will then go back and say well we'll do the research and we will also help them and to be able to turn it back to them to help them out a lot um like i say we are showing that we are an inclusion meaning the aging population is important and valuable to our society and it's not a burden on society because in the past we've had some legislators say oh older adults are just a bunch of uh greedy geezers well that's not true. So we, like I said earlier, we provided um, on our website some information about the value of older adults and why you want to be able to keep them working um, and surviving and thriving for the 40 years and all of the great input and experience that older adults can do. Rich, next slide. This so this is yeah, this just kind of gives you some visuals. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is yeah, just some of the different um, members of Senior Lobby and where we are and, and um, at the Capitol or even in um, some training that we've provided. So. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so in 2021, um, our General Assembly, these are some of the areas that we have chosen to work on, such as healthcare. So one of the big things that we're trying to do is making sure we have enough geriatric healthcare providers in all areas of Colorado. We're finding that we are really don't, do not have enough uh, providers. And so that's a very important one that we are really working on this year. We were trying, to, we had a bill for it last year, but because of the session, it didn't really work out very well for us. Um, we also are trying to in increase access to transportation for older Coloradoans on dialysis. So um, that because we realize that so many of them um, are driven by family members and the dialysis takes a long time and people are having, you know, the family members oftentimes have to end up uh, quitting from their jobs to be able to provide some of this transportation. So we want to be able to say, is there a way that we can uh, in, have additional transportation or to reimburse those that are needing it? Um, housing, you know, as we all know how difficult housing and expensive that it is right now. And the whole issues with um, being individuals being um, evicted. So, the, you know, we know that federally there's a moratorium on that, and also our governor has also created a moratorium um, on eviction. So this is a big area that we're looking at. Increasing the supply of affordable, accessible housing. If you're living on um, a, a just your um, social security, which we know is not enough to just live on, on, on its own, or if you are, have a disability and you're just living on your disability income, it, you can't find housing. So that's an area we're working on. And we found that there are some concerns with the homeowner associations, especially in the 50 plus communities. Now, we're not able to focus on all homeowners associations, but we really right now are trying to focus on just um, the 50 plus communities to be able to make sure that people feel that they can go to their HOAs and not worry about being sued and paying for all of the issues with, with um, lawyers and all of that stuff. So, and again, all these things we'll get into a lot more on our Monday morning meeting. 
Uh, workforce is a big one. Um, age discrimination. One of the areas we're looking at on that is 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 to uh, remove the box. I'm sure you guys heard about that. Um, was it last year it, or the year before when it was passed, where they uh, removed the box for if you ever had, um, I think it was a felony or something like that, to be able to uh, take that off so that people will feel, you know, that they won't be discriminated. So now we're trying to say, people cannot ask about your age, but what's on the application is always, what year did you graduate from high school? What year did you graduate from college? Well, uh, you put two and two together and you can come up with that age of that person. So that's one of the areas that we're looking at. Um, and then uh, providing additional workforce for our caregivers. There's, we just don't have enough caregivers to provide for all of our old, older adults or individuals with disabilities. So that's another area we're looking at. So Rich, you wanna? All right. This a little history of some of our successes. Do you want to so, do you want to run yeah. through? No, Rich, I thought that this is where you took over. I can I jump in and, and um, yeah. So just to, we just thought we'd give uh, some examples uh, for the viewers today, or participants today, of some of the uh, um, issues that senior lobbies worked on over the years, where we've been. Uh, yeah, largely in the lead and um, have been able to really affect some change. Um, I think most, most people around the state know about the senior property tax exemption. Uh, many more may not be aware uh, that the state also has a, uh, a, a program called the property tax rent heat rebate uh, for low-income seniors and disabled, and uh, and it's a way to um, get uh, a little bit of a, of a stipend, if you will, uh, rebate uh, for, uh, again, lower-income folks to help offset the costs of their, if they do have property taxes, but it's mostly uh, ha available for renters uh, to help pay rental costs uh, or offset those costs and uh, heating costs for them. And uh, Senior Lobby was instrumental a couple of years ago in getting that law uh, updated to uh, increase the uh, eligibility for those um, and uh, to increase the amounts that people could, could receive from those because they hadn't been changed in several years and expanding um, the uh, eligibility for those. Uh, the, another example of success for senior lobby, and this is one that has take took many, many, many years um, with senior lobby members uh, law, um, advocating for Colorado to become a mandatory reporting state. For many years, it was just a, uh, um, a voluntary reporting state. Uh, one of only like three left in the country that didn't have a mandatory reporting requirement for various different professionals that um, if they were to um, a, a witness or uh, suspect or have reason to suspect that there was mistreatment uh, of an older adult or an at-risk older adult, um, and so uh, senior lobby had, ad, like I said, advocated for that for, I don't know, almost 20 years probably. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, obviously with uh, the help of many other uh, groups, uh, but was able to uh, get a law passed. Um, God, it's probably been what, Jeanette, about eight years or so ago now. Um, and um, have that, it's been uh, amended a few times since and improved and we've been involved in those. Um, but that's, that's something we're very proud of. Um, I mentioned the senior property tax exemption. Um, senior lobby was very involved in getting that passed in the first place. And um, more recently, um, we uh, were the lead organization in, in uh, promoting legislation that passed that made changes to language and definitions in state law regarding um, the use of the term dementia and defining dementia as a disability. 
Uh, so, and there, there, there have been others, um, but uh, we thought we'd just give you a couple of examples um, in this presentation. And obviously, whoops, I'll go back a second. Obviously, we can uh, uh, happy to uh, answer questions if people have more on that. Say, hey, Rich, what is that a picture of? Where's that? Oh, so that one, I believe, is the picture of the last one for the uh, dementia bill. And where, where is that? Um, What's that? Where is that taken? That is actually inside the governor's office. Once they let you back uh, into uh, the actual governor's office, there's also this big table. And that's how they would set up signings for bills. And uh, so that's, and obviously that was when uh, um, now, now, uh, now Senator Hickenlooper was Governor Hickenlooper. Thanks, Rick. All right. So I'm going to uh, just kind of give a quick overview um, of uh, legislative process and resources for advocates um, and, uh, and then turn it over to Kelly. Um, so I'm starting here with a screenshot of the General Assembly's website, uh, which um, you know people may or may not know actually holds a lot of useful resources completely free. There are a number of paid services out there that, that lobbyists and others use and senior lobby actually ascribes to one. But uh, um, uh, you can, you'd be, just be surprised at how much how many free resources you can get uh, just, just from the, the legislature's website. Um, and uh, what man, I want to go back a sec. So what you have here, for instance, um, the, you can tell at, at, at the top, you can, you can click and go get information about the schedule, what committees are meeting, uh, et cetera. I think when they get into session next week, that that will be the interim will be taken away, and that'll be the schedule where you can go and look at the calendar uh, for each chamber, the House and the Senate, for each for each week. And um, but you also need to understand that you need to check those regularly if you're following a bill or something because they can change from day to day. Um, but there's good information in there. The bills obviously. This will take you to a page where you can do search by, by number, by year, by topic. Um, you can search for bills in the current legislative session. You can also search for bills in previous legislative sessions. Once you get into those, um, then there's additional information. There's the text of the bills. There's a summary of the bill. There's usually a uh, fiscal note which uh, you know, uh, obviously analyzes the, the, the dollar aspects of the bill and you usually includes a, a really good summary of the bill as well. And it'll include history of the actions on, those, on, on the bill. Um, legislators, it's good. This is, hadn't been there for many years uh, uh, in this form. I've found this really useful in recent years. It's got an alphabetical list of, the Sen of all the senators and representatives. Um, you can also sort it and have only senators or only representatives. I think it also allows you to, to download it in, in an Excel spreadsheet form. Uh, so that you can save it and so forth. But again, this is also something that doesn't hurt to check uh, periodically because there, there are changes sometimes during the course of the year. Um, the next one, committees. Uh, again, we use a lot. Uh, you can go directly to a, a particular committee and get information about which legislators serve on that committee, how to contact that, those legislators. Uh, and, and, and also the uh, schedules uh, and, and the agendas for when those committees are meeting. Um, I'll skip initiatives. Uh, obviously that's for um, ballot measures, uh, but, but again, that can be useful information. The one on the budget I use a lot, uh, but this takes you directly to um, essentially the joint budget committee and um, you know, all the information about the um, the uh, budget 
hearings that they're having and the briefings that they're having, documents that staff are providing, which also provide a lot of good information. Um, the, the, it provides the schedule and calendar for the JBC and so forth. And so that's a really useful page as well. Um, and so you can see the rest of the slides there. So with that, I'll, I'll skip that, the rest of that. Um, and you be ha you know, you're well, you do well, whoops, you do well to, uh, to familiarize yourself with that page and even, you know, check out um, some of the different links and so forth, but it's a very useful source of information and we use it a lot. Um, so this next slide um, is our reenactment, if you will, of uh, how a bill becomes law. The, the legislature has published, and I think it's available on their website, a, uh, um, a, a similar chart that uh, is very hard to read. Whoops, gosh, I keep, I'm still learning how to use this thing, folks. Um, and uh, uh, we thought we'd try to simplify it, even though this still looks kind of busy. This is a little, actually uh, uh, much simpler than the one um, uh, that the legislature produces. Um, and I like to characterize the legislative process in a couple of different ways. One being that uh, one of the great benefits of it is that it provides countless opportunities for inputs on a proposal, both, and, and it, that can cut both ways though, but it provides opportunities to make changes to a piece of legislation in the best of circumstances to improve it as it goes along. Uh, but the flip side is that sometimes the process can be used to weaken a bill or sabotage it or, or that kind of thing. But as contrasted oftentimes with initiatives, um, initiatives don't go through anywhere near the extensive vetting process that legislation does during the legislative process. Um, and if you look over in the far top left, where we start with the idea for a bill, um, just to give you an example with, with uh, senior lobby, um, if we're we, we've been, we're looking at, I think Jeanette mentioned them, we're looking at a couple of bills this session, one on uh, increasing the geriatric care workforce and providing uh, incentives for, um, I think it's nurses and advanced practice nurses and uh, um, uh, physicians assistants to specialize in geriatric care through uh, some tuition assistance. Um, and we're also looking at a bill uh, to uh, help offset the costs of uh, dialysis transportation through a fee on the clinics. Uh, we started this by, well, actually first talking amongst ourselves, reaching out to other advocacy groups and um, kind of vetting the idea, seeing if it made sense. Once we, 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 we were ready to, to move ahead, um, the, the first thing we needed to do was to reach out to legislators to see if we could find a legislator who was willing to sponsor the bill. And um, once, we, once we got to that process, then we can move over to number three and the legislator asks legislative legal services, which are the lawyers for the legislature to, to draft the bill. Then we go through a process of reviewing the draft and getting it cleaned up. And, and when it's ready to go and the legislative session is beginning, then the bill gets introduced. Um, and you know, usually it's starting in January. This year, no bills have been introduced yet because they um, met briefly and then just adjourned um, or recessed, uh, we think until next Tuesday. At that time, bills, we can expect bills to start being introduced. And when they're introduced, that's what's called the first reading. And um, then the, they're assigned to a committee and um, the, the legislative council staff gets to work on a fiscal note to prepare for the bill. And that fiscal note has to be ready before the hearing in committee and the bill gets scheduled for a hearing in the committee. Sometimes it can 
get scheduled and then delayed either because of a scheduling conflict for someone or maybe the fiscal notes being delayed. Uh, but once the bill is heard in committee, there's, that's an opportunity for testimony. Um, and as we've started to talk about here, it's been a little bit different uh, this last year with uh, the pandemic and, and the capital being closed or very limited. And uh, so they've struggled uh, I, somewhat, but I, I think have been making efforts to provide for some, some limited in-person testimony, but mostly trying to provide for um, virtual testimony. Although um, it, it, certainly last session, and Kelly may wanna to touch on this too in her comments, um, a lot of it basically came down to just submitting written testimony uh, in advance of the hearing. And then it, you have really no idea if anybody even bothered to look at your, <laughs> at your testimony. So this process, I think the, the actual citizen participation part at this stage has gotten a little bit more difficult with the pandemic. And I think we're all still working on, on how to deal with that. Um, but at that point, once the bill is heard in committee, it can be either uh, passed or killed, or that's what we call postponed, introduced uh, indefinitely, and then it's basically done. Uh, so that's the, one of the other highlights about this process is that there are opportunities all along the way for the bill to just completely fail and be done, done with. Uh, but if you can get through committee, even if it gets amended, it can be passed to another committee uh, if, if, um, for further hearing. Um, it can also be passed uh, or will be passed to the Appropriations Committee if it has a fiscal note. Uh, but once it gets through the committee process, then it goes through the uh, second reading, which is when it's presented on the floor of the particular chamber, whether if it started in the House or the Senate. And at that time, all of the members of that chamber have an opportunity to debate the bill and be, so it's considered by the full chamber. If it gets through second reading and it, it can be amended, uh, then it is brought up usually the next day on third and final reading. Uh, occasionally there are some last minute amendments, but usually uh, third reading um, occurs without that. And then it, it's passed and passed along to the, to the next chamber. And the other key point to make here is that uh, the other chamber goes through the same process all over again. So if the House passes a bill and they send it over to the Senate, the Senate essentially gets an opportunity to say, oh, gee, thanks for sending us this. Now let's see what we want to do with it. <laughs> and uh, they'll go through that same process. Um, if, the, uh, if the second chamber might decide that, hey, they want to make a few changes, I mean, they could even kill it. It, they could get there and say, we don't like this at all. We're just going to kill it. Um, but they could make some changes and some amendments. And uh, once that happens, then if they go through the whole process, pass the bill on third reading, they have to send it back to the original house. And the original house gets to look at it and say, all right, what did you guys do to our bill? We, had, we sent you a perfectly good bill and you mucked it up. Or they might say, oh, you made some good changes. Uh, we've, you caught some things we missed and we're gonna just repass the bill as you sent it to us. And um, at that point, then it gets sent to the governor. But if the second, if the original house says, we don't like some of the stuff that you did um, and uh, we, we wanna talk about it. We wanna go over uh, your changes to the bill. So then the leadership appoints conference committees, three people from each chamber um, and um, at least one person from each party. And uh, that conference committee then meets to go over the differences between the two houses. Most of the time they're, they're able to come to an agreement on either one, one version of the bill or other or making uh, some additional amendments to get the bill to a point where both uh, chambers can agree to it. And then they pass the bill again. And, and in that case, then it again can go to the governor. And uh, so the final step usually in the 
process is that the governor gets to look at the bill, decide whether or not to sign it uh, into law, to let it become law without a signature or to veto the bill and, and send it back and say, I don't like at all what you guys did. I'm just gonna kill the bill right here. And so that's one step in the process that a lot of people forget about. And that we lobbyists hear about um, when we first starting, when we first start out doing this job is that one of the most important things you, you can do uh, or learn to do when you're advocating is to learn how to count. And mm -hmm. in the context of the legislature, learning how to count means learning how to count to 33 in the House, learning how to count to 18 in the Senate, because those are the numbers that give you a majority, a bare minimum majority. Uh, but you also need to learn how to count to one, which means you need to take into consideration that the governor is going to have the last say on any legislation that gets to his desk. So you got to make sure that the governor is going to sign the bill. Uh, so anyway, to wrap this up, after that, um, one area that senior lobby is starting to get a little bit more involved in and pay more attention to, again, that, that often gets forgotten about, is with a lot of bills, uh, once they're passed, you gotta, you got to pay attention to implementation and make sure that they can get implemented. And a lot of that often is in rulemaking uh, by state agencies. And uh, so that's another area where we really get to work. Um, on uh, advocating for older adults. So with that, and I don't know if somebody's, uh, if one of you guys can be paying attention to the chat for me, inter in interrupt me if I need to answer any questions, okay? Uh, the only thing is uh, we, we got a comment here from Ed about uh, if you could comment, you or Kelly could comment on how one party can slow the process down and, and also a, a, a mention about the, the skill of the folks who actually read the bills in the chamber. Um, <clears throat> there was an article recently about, about a couple of those people. And um, so- Well, that Kelly, second one, why don't you go, do you, why don't you talk about that second one? Cause I'm not sure <laughs> what, you, what that one, well, I didn't see that article, but then I'll answer Ed's question. Okay, well, Basically, what, what that was all about was that there are there, and they featured two people, and uh, that I, I'm sorry, I don't remember their names right now, but um, who are the people who actually have to read the bills? Because that is part of the process. Oh, I see. I thought you were talking about legislators. Yeah, those are the readers yeah, in, talk, the house, yeah, in the house, in the uh, the reading clerks. They're the ones that, um, like, when the bills are introduced they read the title and I think, and Kelly, again, may correct me. I think uh, there's a, uh, I don't know if it was in, may, it might even be in the constitution that they're supposed to read the bill at length, the whole bill, but there's also a provision where they can, uh, with unanimous consent, um, uh, forego reading the whole bill and then they just read the title. Um, uh, and, uh, but a lot of times on like resolutions, they read the whole thing. Uh, but and then they they read through um, uh, through the uh, uh, you know the calendar they you know, they're the ones that introduced the topics and they again they read the titles of the bills and that kind of thing and and um, over the years we've had many of them that are extremely skilled in reading quickly but legibly um, throughout. Um, their time and it, it's 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 been pretty impressive. So I didn't know if there was any other point you wanted to make, Bob, but that's what I know about those folks. No, well that that's that's the uh, that was it, you know. Okay. And and the fact that you know the bill's only read it its entirety if somebody asks asks for that to happen. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. There was a lot of controversy about that the last yeah. session. And that gets a little bit into uh, Ed's, Ed's question or comment about delay tactics sometimes. Um, um, I mean, I think my experience, again, and others can, can jump in on this later, um, but my experience is um, one of the tactics that can be used, um, and it ob obviously would be used by, say, an opposition to a bill, uh, to slow would be to slow it down, particularly if you don't think you have the votes to amend it properly or kill it properly. One thing you might do 
is try to use the process to slow the bill down and delay it as much as possible. Um, and one tactic is to object to um, not reading and require that uh, the, the bill be read at length. And sometimes I can't remember exactly, but there have been bills that um, you know literally would take hours and hours and hours to read. And so we've had examples of uh, those readers reading really, really fast. We've had examples of chambers that had said, well, you know, what we could do is we could just break the bill up in parts and we can have uh, actually members of our party uh, read portions of the bill to, so that it would take less time. Uh, I think there was even, uh, was either, I don't think it was last year, it might've been two years ago, where um, maybe in the Senate, they employed a machine that could read it really, really, really fast. Um, and I think they were taken to court over that. And I never, I don't remember what ended up happening <laughs> with that court case. Um, but, uh, you know, it's sort of like versions of the filibuster, I think, to try to uh, slow processes down. Uh, another, another question, uh, Rich, uh, on the, uh, the idea of, we have an idea for a bill. Uh -huh. And um, is it possible for any group, any advocacy group to go directly to legislative legal services and, hey, I'd like to work with you on, on this bill. Um, is, that, is that even a possibility? All right, yeah, and let me also, I'm just seeing Evie's uh, comment in the chat correcting me. So, uh, and, and Evie's a former uh, legislator, so she would know um, that bills are read at length only if requested. So, uh, but again, it can still be a tactic uh, that people can use. So thanks for that. And then on the question, I, I think that you're talking about Phil's question. Yes. Um, is, no, I, the, the only way you can get a bill drafted is from uh, a legislator specifically making that request. And then the, that legislator also has to tell the drafter that you have uh, um, or their permission to work with the drafter on the bill. So um, the lead is, you really go through the legislature, legislator in that process. All right, so um, so this just uh, again, a, a, an overview of uh, then from the advocacy perspective and education. And that's really what we see, what we feel at Senior Lobby that we're doing that in, in I guess we lobby, but really um, we try to educate legislators and um, other um, uh, interests um, and uh, citizens uh, about issues affecting older adults and advocate on behalf of older Coloradans and um, we, we've been really working very hard in the last few years uh, to improve the way we operate, to get uh, more statewide, uh, to cover uh, a variety of different issues uh, that affect older adults. And um, as, as mentioned here uh, in a nonpartisan way, because you know, we feel that these issues, uh, issues affecting older adults really do cut across uh, any kind of boundary you could think of, and they're definitely not partisan issues, or shouldn't be anyway. Um, and uh, we're, again, we're working hard to, whoops, see, I keep doing that. Uh, we, we're working hard to uh, uh, really get a reach around the state, get folks involved in advocating uh, for the uh, concerns of older adults in their region, and um, senior lobbies uh, interested in helping to facilitate that, um, both in terms of ch things like this, where we just try to um, educate on uh, helping to understand the legislative process, how to advocate, um, and so forth. Uh, you know, we, we conduct uh, legislative trainings. Uh, in, in recent years, we've done several of them, and we're um, open to, to doing more of those. Today is more of presentation, you know, more general content. 
uh, if we get interest from folks, we uh, will plan to do more extensive legislative and advocacy trainings. <clears throat> Uh, let's see here. What do I got next? So this is a um, this is an example of uh, or a listing of the um, as probably not all, but a good number of the partners that Senior Lobby has worked with and does work with on uh, older adult issues. And I'm going to use this as a uh, uh, opportunity to turn it over to Kelly and. Um, talk about uh, AARP and uh, any other uh, insights that she has for us as far as uh, advocacy and virtual advocacy. <clears throat> well, thank you, Rich. It's nice to see, see everyone this morning. Um, definitely a different senior day this year, but nonetheless, it's always good to see everybody. Um, so I'm Kelly Fritz, Associate State Director with AARP Colorado, and I'm going on 20 years with AARP. And in case anybody didn't know, AARP um, originally stood for the American Association of Retired Persons, but just like KFC used to be Kentucky Fried Chicken, we're now AARP, and we represent those over the age of 50. We're similar to the senior lobby in that um, we are nonpartisan. We don't give money, we don't give donations. Um, we just look at the policy. We have a national policy council that does advocacy work for AARP and they basically establish the positions that we will take. Um, and then more or less um, we have priorities based on that policy as to what we really heavily engage in. Um, basically, we, you know, our big things have been for many years, healthcare obviously is a big concern for our members, prescription drugs, caregiving, long-term care. Um, we've gotten more in recent years, gotten more into affordable housing as an issue. Um, but that's, again, that's been more recent years for us. Um, utilities has always been a big thing for AARP. And specifically right now, we're working on the Office of Consumer Council that's getting ready to sunset. And a lot of people go, what, what's that? Office of Consumer Council. And the first thing I always point out is how it's spelt. It's not, you know, council like council, S-C-I-L, it's, it's, you know, U-L. So it's, it's more of a legislative legal term of art. And what it does is it works with consumers on utility cases in front of the Public Utilities Commission. And it's not something that's real sexy, but when it was up five years ago, it literally shut down the legislature at the end. It became very political. <clears throat> and it's a little bit unusual for this, you know, this agency. So that's up again. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute as to what we're already seeing on that as far as testifying and so forth. But Anyway, so ARP, we do work on issues both at the national and the local level. Um, you know, we work a lot on federal issues. You're probably aware of that. We were big supporters when <laughs> Medicare added a prescription drug benefit to Medicare, Medicare Part D. Um, so, you know, we do things there. We also supported the Affordable Care Act because people over the age of 50 need health care and are more likely to have a pre existing condition. Um, so it was one of the many reasons why we supported the Affordable Care Act, but we did heavily engage in that as well. And something called Social Security, always a big deal for us at ARP, making sure that that's solvent for now and into the future so that everybody can rely on that. Um, it's very important. I always like to point out it's an earned benefit, earned benefit. You know, I, I go ballistic when I hear people call it an entitlement. You know, yeah, you're entitled to it. You paid into it, um, but it's your earned benefit. And when you need it, it should be there for you. So we still are very heavily engaged in that as an issue. So um, what we do again, because we don't have a PAC, you know, we're similar to the senior lobby and that our, you know, how we, our power, use our power is through our members and through our volunteers to be our voice at the Capitol and to um, at the federal level and at the state level to make calls, to send emails, write letters. You know, there's all kinds of different ways from which we advocate. But again, so we're, we're 
a little bigger than the senior lab because we are a national organization, but we're similar, at least on the issues we work on at the state level. Um, like the senior lobby, our volunteers get together every Monday morning. We didn't get together today because many of our folks are actually here today. I'm excited to say Dr. Mary Fries is among the audience today. She is our advocacy chair. She does a great job. We're very grateful to have Dr. Mary. Um, we have several people who have medical um, professions and their backgrounds, so it's great because healthcare, as I said, that's a big issue for us at ARP, and we do heavily engage in that. Um, some in other issues that we are working on this session in particular at the Capitol, um, we haven't talked about it, but the older Coloradans programs and specifically things that keep older adult services that and supports that keep older adults at home and independent. Always a big issue. Um, we do work very closely with the senior lobby on that. Um, several years ago, my friend Rich and I um, amended a bill like the very last day of session so that money with the senior homestead exemption that if they overestimated the cost for that, that um, any money that they over or over budgeted for that would go back to older Coloradans program. So that was a really fun win for us, but always we'd like to see the money for that increase. We think that, you know, again, it's the right thing to do. People as they get older, want to stay in their communities. They want to age in place. And we really think that the older Coloradans funds are the best way to do that. And so to make that consistent funding source would be great. Consisting slash increasing. You know, our friends in the nursing home, there's, their budget always goes up and ours is always like, yeah, and then we got to fight and scrap to, you know, get minimal money for this. Always been an issue ever since I've been at ARP. So, you know, we work very hard on that. Um, we also are very heavily engaged in the broadband efforts to expand broadband to all Colorado. Um, the reason why, you know, we're parents and grandparents, we're concerned about you know, kids getting the education they need, but we're also concerned about telehealth, making sure that older adults can, you know, talk to a doctor if they need to online, it's a big deal. And so we're really trying to look at how can we do that? The question there is always money. How are you gonna pay for it? And that's always an ongoing issue here in Colorado. As you probably know, we have TABOR, the Taxpayer Bill of Wrongs, as we affectionately refer to it as most restrictive tax and spending limitation in the United States. So anytime you do anything here, you always gotta go, how are you gonna pay for it? You know, Rich talked about that committee um, in fiscal notes. Yeah, that's a big deal. And that can tank your bill before you even get it out of the chute because everything pretty much costs money. So, you know, what, whether to administrate it, you know, just a lot of different things cost money. So anyway, broadband, how are you gonna do it? cost a lot of money to run wires over mountains. You know, so that's always the big question, who's gonna pay for it and how are you gonna get that done? But I think there is gonna be some interesting legislation this year that we hope to support on that. Um, you know, we strongly believe too that with broadband, because it is the modern form of communication that it does need to have oversight by the Public Utilities Commission and specifically, you know, one of the things about it, you may remember years ago when they deregulated telecom that, you know, 911 is still an issue. So if you're calling over a computer or you're calling over a phone, we want to make sure that 911 gets through, that 911 call gets through. So it's about accountability and safety too. So, you know, broadband is a multifaceted issue and something I get excited about and can talk about for hours, but, you know, not everybody's that into that like I am. So anyway, um, we also do a lot, like I said, healthcare prescription drugs. There are several bills that we are looking at this session. We have a call on Wednesday with the, um, with the healthcare policy and finance office to talk about, or their lobbyists to talk about reimportation of prescription drugs. Colorado did pass a bill to allow that from Canada, but they're looking at trying to expand it to other countries beyond Canada. And we're also working with the governor's office and the Lieutenant Governor's office on affordability board for prescription drugs. Again, trying to bring down the price of prescription drugs. So we work on that at the federal level and we work on that at the state level. 
And then, um, like I was talking about very quickly, the Office of Consumer Counsel. So every time you have an agency in Colorado, there's a sunset period for it to make sure that it really is a valid agency. So they're looking at that right now with the Consumer Council. And on Friday, they had a hearing for that, which is kind of frustrating because we're technically not in session, but we had to be there to get a bill introduced to continue the Office of Consumer Council. And I'll just say, and testifying for that was a really frustrating process. You know, it used to be you'd go to the Capitol, you'd sign up, you testify. You can't do that. Now what you got to do is in advance, you have to register to testify. So you got to have this thought out in advance. Um, you can give your testimony to a portal, but as Rich said, it's more or less a black hole. You know, I don't know where that stuff is going. Um, but anyway, so you have to register and then you have to connect with their IT people. And even then, our volunteers still had issues getting through to that committee on Friday. He did finally get through, but it took about an hour to connect him. And that does seem to be pretty consistent that testimony, they have not got this figured out and how to do this at the Capitol. And that is going to be very frustrating for all of us. Um, you know, to counter that, we did submit our testimony in advance in writing to the different members of the committee to make sure that it didn't just go nowhere. But again, you got to just really be vigilant. Like we have never been vigilant before. And we need to have those relationships like we've never had them before. You know, we're encouraging our volunteers to call their representative and their senator to get to know them so that when we do have things before their committees, they're prepared and they know who, you know, our volunteers are and, you know, and vice versa so that they can work together throughout the legislative process. But again, this is frustrating for all of us. Um, I'm grateful that we have so many people that we are a team and in the senior community, we are pretty united in what we work on. So we're gonna need to keep that up. So anyway, there's a few of my little thoughts. Well, that's great, Kelly. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, and I also appreciated you bringing up uh, the, the various issues that you're working on and, and the fact that for the most part, uh, either we're working on the same issues from the same side or uh, we support each other in, in the areas where we're emphasizing. Um, and also appreciated since I'm affiliated with an area agency on aging, uh, bringing up the issue of uh, um, stable funding for area agencies on aging. That's something that Senior Lobby uh, also uh, gets involved with every year. And um, again, uh, last year with uh, the budget problems, um, there was a significant amount of, of uh, funding um, and cash fund balance that was taken away from AAAs and used to balance the budget. Uh, we have some similar concerns about that happening this year. So I should have mentioned that, but that is definitely an, another issue um, uh, from the budgetary side uh, that we'll be paying attention to. Um, and so with that, Bob, let me see, do we need to see if there's additional questions or what do you need from us? I didn't see any more uh, questions. There are a few comments in here, uh, links to different articles um, that have been provided by uh, Mark uh, Newton. So thanks, Mark, for that. Um, there's a thing on media literacy implementation. And um, so we have that. <clears throat> um, I, I don't see any other questions. Uh, a couple things I, I think I'd like to just add here. Um, one is that um, we've been trying, we, we have been trying to work with uh, the state treasurer and and through him the county treasurers on uh, an issue that so uh, we think is is of some value when that is uh, several years ago there was a law passed regarding what what is called the property tax deferral for seniors and and the disabled 
And um, what we've learned over the last year or so is that that program is not very, very well implemented in most counties. Uh, we have, I think, 64 counties in Colorado, so it's been well implemented in one. Um, <laughs> and that would be Boulder County. Um, and, and digging into this a lot further, we, we've learned that uh, a large part of the reason for that is that the, it, it requires a huge amount of administrative work to, to do it because uh, it's basically, it, it, you know, it's, it sets up a, a loan against the property and uh, it causes a lot. So it, it's a lot of paperwork um, and it has to be kept up with every year. So um, we have started talking to uh, a legislator about, you know, how do we work on, on this from an implementation standpoint? So, so I, I, one of the main reasons I brought this up was uh, going back to that one slide about, you know, the fact that once the law is finally passed and signed by the governor, it, it goes, it, it has to go to be implemented. So I think uh, a lot of times what happens in the, in the legislature is uh, laws get passed by legislators and then they're handed off to someone else to, um, to implement. And in, in this case in particular, this law was a lot harder to implement than anyone anticipated. So uh, there's, a, there's a disconnect there that you know, we, we, we continue to try to work on. So while I was speaking, you know, we got a question. So I don't know if you saw it, Rich. I'm checking it out right now. Let's see. Okay. Um, the, this is about the mandatory uh, reporting of elder abuse law um, and um, information that maybe it's not being effectively implemented throughout the state. Um, and that there's almost no prosecutions of elder abuse. Um, I don't, I don't know that, uh, if anyone wants to put something in the chat as an answer to that, the only thing that that makes me think of, and this is from, uh, former Senator Evie Hudak, Hudak again, um, actually one other area related to that, actually, uh, that senior lobby was also involved in being the lead on a bill a couple of years ago was um, amending the statutes to actually strengthen the laws regarding, um, God, I'm trying to remember the term now, Bobby, Bob, maybe you do, but it was essentially uh, abuse of at-risk elders and uh, the difficulty that uh, prosecutors were having in bringing cases. And um, we worked with uh, district attorneys particularly and others to get a bill introduced to um, refine some of the definitions to incur and part of the problem was uh, some of the penalties were you know viewed by many as slap on the hand and so district or you know uh, like prosecutors weren't even willing to bring charges against them so we got some of those penalties increased in the law and I'd be happy when I get a chance to try to go back and dig up that bill and, and or, or a citation for that. But that's the only other thing that I can think of on that, uh, Evie. So the, the other, uh, another comment on that, and this is something that we, we heard in talking about what Rich was just mentioning is that most of the elder abuse is by family members. And because of that, um, often the person who's being abused does not choose to prosecute because it is a family member. And um, it's uh, sad, but true. So there you go. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we have a, a Theodore would like to make a comment on uh, citizen involvement. So, um, so Theodore, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I am a um, snowbird from Arizona uh, to Colorado. Hold on one second. I have to.
Uh, Theodore, you're, you're, it's not working. <laughs> I, I, okay, you can hear me now? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I'm a snowbird from Arizona. Um, I, I come to Colorado for a, about six or seven months out of the year. And um, in, in Arizona, folks, we generally are regarded as uh, uh, weird, weird uh, red state, but we're turning more and more blue. Uh, and one of the things that has happened, I, I hear, I've heard some of the discussion that you've had regarding um, um, your ability to communicate with legislators, to access uh, uh, the process through uh, the internet remotely in lieu of the Capitol building being shut down to the public in so many instances. And Arizona has uh, a, a program that, that I have only recently found out is apparently unique to that state, which I don't understand, um, considering that I would think that almost every state in the union um, really is interested in citizen input regarding any legislation that they're conducting. And this program is called Right to Speak, Request to Speak. And what that program allows is through, uh, uh, everyone is, is allowed to access the, the, the entire legislative process basically in the state has been computerized, um, has been put out through the state's government uh, website. Um, and, and so any citizen throughout the state, you don't have to show up at the Capitol building on the day that that uh, uh, you don't have to make a request to get on the agenda in order to talk about your personal perspective on or that of, an, of, of a group that you may be representing regarding any legislation specifically that's going on, but rather every uh, citizen in the state is allowed to be given a secret passcode that is basically as secure as your passcode that allows you to get into your own personal bank account, and, um, and you can access whatever legislation is going on in the state through the internet. You can do it in your underwear in your, from the comfort of your bedroom at three o'clock in the morning if that's what you want to do. Um, so it doesn't require having to show up at the Capitol building. And everyone has the opportunity to say, I agree with this, I vote yes. Uh, or write a lengthy dissertation about why they might disagree with particular specific legislation that's being proposed, um, as long as it's in committee and it's and it's um, it's being processed through uh, it's it's actively being worked on through the process uh, of legislation. Um, uh, citizens can provide their input. This becomes particularly important when we uh, shortly after, usually shortly after elect elections, uh, the Republicans try to dr dram jam through a, a bunch of legislation that, uh, for example, uh, 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 interferes or restricts voting eligibility, access to the polls, these kinds of things. And when one legislator stands up and says, you know, I'm proposing this and this and this legislation, the opponent, the opposing side uh, representatives are able to stand up and say, well, here we've got documentation of a thousand citizens throughout the state that have voiced their opposition to this and they don't think that it's a good idea. All of a sudden, bills are easily able to get uh, uh, deleted. And the question that I have is, I only recently came to find out that something like this doesn't really exist in Colorado. You have to go to the Capitol, you have to get on the agenda and in order to voice your opinion. And um, uh, wonder, you know, has this been, are, are you all, uh, uh, do you have anybody in your group that's aware of this type of a program where people can just log on at any time that they want, see what legislation is being proposed and be able to participate, uh, whether it's specifically for seniors or for anybody else. 
and it's not totally nonpartisan. It's, I mean, everybody can participate. Uh, well, th thank you, Theodore. I, I think we'll have to take a look at that and uh, and and see. Um, I know Kelly Fritz uh, would have has counterpart in in Arizona. She can probably learn more about it and uh, tell us about it. Yeah, it's uh, called ask, request to speak. Pardon me. It's called request to speak. You can go yeah, on. We'll, we'll, we'll take yeah. a look at. It. So thank yeah. you for bringing that to our attention. Well, and I sure. know that we can now listen into committee hearings, um, but it's the testimony part or participation part that maybe we're, we're lacking. Right. And so there's Kelly, a way, you know, in Colorado, they did before all this happened, before the pandemic, they did increase, you know, the ability to testify via remote, but it was like specific sites around the state where you had to go to and then you could testify and then you'd see it up on the screen. Again, they're they're just not there as far as the technology, you know, to really testify in front of these individual committees yet. They're working on it, but they're not there yet. You know, in the meantime, what Rich was showing you earlier, you know, there are links so you can see all the different bills that are out there from a citizen perspective. And I put in the chat our bill link too, so you can see all the bills that we're tracking. And it'll also show you where they are in the process. So the tools kind of are out there. They're just not refined to where they should be for us here in Colorado yet. Hopefully that happens this session. So, Yeah, well, we, we shall see. But uh, thanks again, Theodore. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll check it out further in what they're doing in Arizona and, and see if we can get something down here. We have a governor who's a, a technology executive. So uh, <laughs> We shall see. <clears throat> uh, did we have another comment here, uh, Rich? Um, I don't see. I mean, we had um, um, one comment um, about on the implementation issue. And, um, you know, I think, uh, and you talked about that a little bit, Bob, already. Um, we're working to get better at that. And, um, but usually, if there are concerns with implementation of, of the issue, one of the first steps would be to contact the state agency that's involved in uh, implementing that and find out, you know, do some uh, information gathering, find out why that's not happening and so forth, and then make a determination uh, what your next steps are uh, from there. Um, but that's something that, that I think we're very open to um, ideas and working with others who want to get involved in helping us with that. Jeanette, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, no, I, I was just going to uh, reiterate that, that um, you really, for being a previous uh, state director for aging, it, the most courteous thing to do is to contact that state agency first and to find out um, what's going on and to get, you know, hear their side of it. And then if you really feel like it is not implementing correctly, um, the last resort would be to go to somebody like the Attorney General's or the um, Office of, um, oh gosh, now I just forgot the name of it, where they actually go in and do the investigations of looking um, at the different programs. So, but Usually, um, if things are not implemented correctly or the way that you think they should be, then um, it's best to go back to that state agency first. Okay, thanks, Jeanette. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any other other questions or, or comments? Um, we have one here from Francette asking, what's what's Evie's experience been as a former legislator? And, and I'm not sure what the context is. I just put up a response too from my experience with working with her. So she was always a great advocate for us and wonderful to work with. But uh, she, and she was, I think, both in both in the House and the Senate mm -hmm. for a number no, of years. No, I, I think she was just only in the House. In the but no, she was. On, I'm sorry, she was only, only in the Senate. 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 There she is. Hi, yeah. Hi only in the Senate. Hi, everyone. Okay. Well, you were so effective. I thought you were both. <laughs> no, I was on the State Board of Education That's, yeah. before I was in the State Senate. Okay, got it. Yeah. But I don't know what this question means. What was my experience? What's my experience as a former legislator? Uh, could you ask a little more specifically? Okay. Um, uh, maybe I misunderstood since, Evie, since you brought up the... Um, 
um, the concern of, of not having laws implemented, you know, very, you know, adequately uh, on the uh, um, elder abuse uh, laws. Uh, I I thought I thought you were uh, a legislator, a former legislator. So I thought maybe you had insight. Former legislator. To, yeah. So I thought that you would have some insight as to whether or not if something's not being implemented and we went through you know all the advocacy and and you know all the channels and things aren't going very well what was your experience as a legislator uh would you have gone directly to the attorney general's office and say hey this isn't working this is supposed to work and it's not right so the state attorney general has so that, some jurisdiction, but not fully. I mean, district attorneys are the ones who really do the imp implementation of the prosecution. And so um, basically I found that I had to work with my, well, in my own county, I work with my own district attorney's office and they, they do a pretty good job. But um, as far as statewide, uh, unfortunately, we have, I don't know, 20 some odd judicial districts. And so people have to have to go to their own. Um, these people are, are they run for election. And so um, they this could be something that people could look at when somebody is running for district attorney, if they have a previous track record, if they're running for re-election, or if they're running to be elected for the first time, then it, it's a good issue to ask, um, you know, if there are opportunities to, uh, in town hall meetings or other campaign events, to ask these people how they feel about it and what they might do about it. Okay. And some, Jeanette put in the senators and representatives who um, typically work on this. I know I worked with Zenzinger initially. He was my successor. And um, Danielson has done a lot of work on it. Um, and they, they were the ones who did some of the follow-up bills because there were, there were some gaps in the initial legislation that I sponsored. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Thanks. We're we're uh, we got about three minutes left, so uh, I think that the question that Jeanette was answering in part was to um, which legislators are the ones that are the most active advocates for the issues of older adults in Colorado, and uh, the ones that that she mentioned are um, <clears throat> Senator Jan Senators Janal and Danielson and Representative uh, Kennedy, Wiseman and uh, Herod is the, is the ones that, that we know are most interested. There, may, there, there probably are others, but those are the ones we hear from the most. Um, and we need to continue to cultivate more. Um, exactly. So as you, as you think about, you know, who are your representatives and senators in your particular districts, which you can find very easily, um, <clears throat> start cultivating those relationships. Uh, that, that was mentioned earlier by Kelly as well. You know, cultivate those so that uh, we, we get more traction with, uh, with those folks on, on the issues that we're proposing. Um, so Rich, we've got, uh, I, I, I just put a, um, the note in the chat that I haven't clicked on yet, but it has a, a, a link to a, an evaluation. So we'd appreciate everyone's evaluation of the session. And if you are interested in getting further, deep diving more deeply into the, the issues of uh, the legislative process, you know, you can make a comment in, in that evaluation as well. So uh, Rich, do you want to put that, uh, your PowerPoint back up again and- uh, mm. Let me see if I can do that. Okay. Okay. That's my last slide on there. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and this one making the point that uh, but I think it's always important to make on these presentations is that um, I really believe that ultimately uh, the most important and powerful 
advocates are um, all of the all of you <laughs> and uh, constituents. Um, you know, and it's almost sort of like it, <clears throat> we have to play an inside and outside game. There may be those of us uh, that say are on this presentation today uh, who uh, do this for a living or uh, as a as a vocation as as volunteers in most of our in most of their cases. Uh, but we're active every day, and we used to be down at the Capitol every day or whatever. Um, but, uh, um, and, and we have a certainly an important role to play, but when, I think when it comes right down to it, uh, the success oftentimes really relies on uh, constituents who are informed and are advocating in their own areas of the state or their own areas of interest, they're contacting their legislators, uh, et cetera, legislators, um, are much more likely to listen to their own constituents uh, than anything else. And so that's one of the, uh, I think, guiding principles uh, for senior lobby. And we encourage folks to get involved. Um, and we, you know, whether if it's AARP Colorado or senior lobby, we're here to help facilitate your involvement in the process. Thank you, Rich. Um, so I have one, one quick last thing that I want to show you. It's a 30 second uh, video and it's from our sponsor uh, and it uh, applies to folks who have impaired hearing. And so I, I'd like to play that. And then um, I, I think uh, after that, um, unless you have something else, Rich, I th you know, Jeanette, I think we're done. Uh, and I, I don't see any further comments in the chat box. Um, at least. I'm going to just stop sharing. And uh, we had a couple questions about the slides. The slides will be available on our website as well. The the recording of this session. Um, it won't be happen immediately, but it will happen soon. And um, so I'm so Rich. I'm going to. Um, share the screen here and show this this video is uh, from our uh, sponsor Relay Colorado and uh, it, again it's about what you know, helping folks who have impaired hearing. Okay. Okay, so we, we thank Relay Colorado for uh, sponsoring today, and um, if there's nothing else, I, I think uh, this kind of wraps things up. Rich, do you, Jeanette, anything else you want to add? I thank everybody for coming and joining us. And yes, and, and also I'd like to say I, a lot of us did not hear any of the um, information from the Relay Colorado. There was no sound on it, so maybe you can just put that link in the chat and people can actually um, hear it on their own computers. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry about that. And thank you, Kelly, for joining us. Great. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And like I said, if you want more information on advocacy, if you are want to go down, um, if you want to be able to figure out how to contact your legislator about the issues. Um, we have information like that on our website um, about making sure you contact them, um, make it short, sweet, and consent, consensual, I mean, right to the point. And uh, make sure that um, in the um, email, if you're sending an email, you let them know that you are a constituent. They really like to hear that from their, their own constituents and put in your own story and why the bill may or may not uh, be a good one or how you would like to see it changed if possible. Um, and so that, that way they have the specifics. Make sure you put in your contact information too so they can get back to you um, if they have a question on it. So 
thank you everyone uh, for attending and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Okay, thanks a lot, folks. All right, mm -hmm. take care, have a good day. Bye-bye. Uh,